I came here today because I want to make education accessible by everybody. Um, I actually work on a foundation to make that happen that also works on affordable homes as well too, but I have nothing to sell you here today. So I don't do mentoring. I don't have coaching programs. I don't have sales programs and I don't need your money to invest with, obviously, if I own the apartments myself. So I put together this presentation. It'll be about 45 minutes to an hour. Put some of my best things together of how I scaled uh, from 2013 to today with the unit count that I currently have. So my story, guys. So you can see this on my website as well. I'm going to give you the short version of it. But uh, before this slide, you know, I started, uh, I got into real estate in 2013. But before then, um, you know, my mom was a teacher. My dad worked in a factory. We didn't come from money. I didn't have any friends, any family members that were in real estate or also had money. So I landed in real estate because I wanted to make money and everything that school taught me that my friends told me that my family told me didn't align with making money. So you read enough books, eventually you get to learn a little bit more about what is the best avenue to be able to make money. And at least for me, that was real estate. My first decade in business actually starts before real estate. I worked for a fortune 50 company that I would say that first 10 years was me learning a lot about leadership, about operations, and about financials. I started as an intern and I slowly worked my way up to some pretty big jobs. At one point, I led 19,000 people, oversaw three and a half billion worth of sales. I had an operations role where I traveled the country looking at different areas of Target stores and figured out how to run them more effectively and more efficiently by changing team members' roles. So my W-2 job taught me a lot about leadership and people. It taught me a lot about building systems and operations. And it also taught me to look at every business, right, their P&L, and, and be able to adapt that to the systems to be able to make more money. As I started making more money in 2013, uh, I was struggling, and my wife was I struggling to, be, to have our money work as hard as we were working. So... Up until that point, we're putting our money into things like stocks, 401ks, IRAs, et cetera. And just, we felt like it wasn't working as hard or we didn't understand how it was working. So we wanted to try real estate, read it in a couple books. That was it. No program, no mentorship, read a couple books, underwrote a deal and bought a single family home. My next decade in business is from 2013 to 2023. It's almost all real estate. When I bought that first home and I underwrote that first deal, it left us with $7 in our bank account. So we put everything on it, saved up for a couple years, right? Bought it ourselves. And I was so surprised. Like there's two life changing moments for me when it comes to real estate and business. One of them was being able to buy our first property and underwrite the deal so that 12 months later, the cash flow was about the same. And why that was life changing for me is because up until that point, Every where I put my money, I mean, if you ask how much I was going to make and if it would be in my bank account when I put it into a 401k, I'd had no idea a year from now where, where that would be. So I love the predictability of it. I like the control. So the next year we saved up all our money again and we bought a duplex. So first year we bought one unit, second year we bought two units. That went pretty well. So then the next year we doubled again. So we bought two duplexes, four units, seven units. I'm managing them myself learning a lot about real estate, learning a lot about business, still working 70 hours a week, by the way, in my W-2 job, working the nights and weekends, putting in the work. And then at seven units, it started to get a little bit tough with working birth jobs. And I figured, hey, one of the things that's making me successful at my Fortune 50 company in a leadership position is be able to lead people. I'm going to hire a third party property management company. I'll hold them accountable. I'll tell them about the business strategy. So I used the third party property management company from seven units to 252 units. So that takes you to 2019. Um, and one day I was looking at how much cash flow that 252 units was making. And somewhere on that journey, by the way, I said there's two life changing moments. The second life changing moment is when I bought my first apartment. And I started digging into the apartment and started understanding how apartments run. And finally, I realized that this entire time I was buying all these small properties that I had to stop looking at my properties as properties, as real estate, they're businesses. Once I started looking at them as businesses, 
all the things that I learned over a decade of leadership and in my W-2 job, I could apply, right, to, to real estate and to my portfolio and building systems, it really started to take off. And that's how I got to the 252 units. At 252 units, I retired from my W-2 job. First thing I wanted to start for a guy that likes operations and systems, understands people, and, and my wife makes fun of me, but I enjoy looking at P&Ls on the weekends, just something I do. Um, I started a property management company, right? So I started a property management company. Uh, I also made it a construction company at the same time. I invest in value add properties and those definitely need construction. And that takes 2019 to 2023. I go from 252 units to at the end of this year, it'll be about 3,800. So everything happened with the systems that I'm going to create. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. So this year, guys, before I get into things, this is what I've been up to in 2023. I am going to close on 1,116 units. So I'm closing on about 100 units a month at this pace. Uh, 864 of them are closed. I have an 88 unit that I'm closing, in, I think next week or the week after. And then 164 units I'm closing in December. And then 384 units uh, under contract and will be closing in January. So I know it's been a tough economic year and there's a lot of things going on, but there's a ton of opportunity. And maybe this will surprise you, but we can talk about this at the end. I don't mind rates where they are. In fact, I'm okay if they continue to go up. I think competition is going down. And if you know how to run your properties, this is a great opportunity to be able to buy them. My pre owned company started with four people. This year it went over 100. So I got 100 employees at the property management company. Um, I launched the Rankin Family Foundation. Don't have time to get into that. But if you want to know more about that, it's RankinFamilyFoundation.org. Pretty passionate about it. I have a hold co company, which basically invests in other companies um, and teaches them how to build systems, et cetera, et cetera. That grew to three businesses this year. And then I'm really proud of this one, but we broke our, our, I've broken into several different markets and even a new state this year. Uh, we have a pretty big complex in Ohio. So it just goes to show that if you are able to create systems and grow, you can not only do that in a territory that you're already in, but you can get out of that territory, which obviously opens up a lot of opportunity. Let's get into it. So Marcus asked me to talk about, he said, people would be very interested in how you did it. Like, how did you scale? So I said, all right, I'm going to put together, I, I told him I'm going to put together something I never put together before. A lot of times when I speak at real estate events, I go over the things that are pretty sexy, like creative financing and negotiating and all these other things. But that is not how I scaled. There's two big reasons of how I scaled. And number one is leadership. Every time I come to one of these or I look in social media, there's somebody bragging about how they scaled through creative financing or buying the deal or selling the deal or whatever. Guys, if you really want to, if you want a couple hundred units or 10, 20 units, fine. I mean, sure. Creative financing is awesome. I'm not going to, I've used creative financing. It's awesome. But if you want to get to a thousand units, or 4,000 units and continue to scale, you have to know leadership because you need people, right? Without people in your organization, without a good attorney, right, to protect you, without a good property management company that can do the things that you need to do, leadership is what's gonna take you there. Whether they directly work for you or you have a third party management company, at the end of the day, you're gonna need to lead them. And throughout this presentation, I'm gonna give you actual examples um, that will really help you do that too. Three big ways or lessons that I've learned in leadership um, that I wanted to share with you today is I see most people in real estate working in their business and not on it. So I get this question asked a lot on social media, who was your first hire? My first hire was the president of my property management company. He's actually here today. His name's Josh. I hired him first and he had no real estate experience, didn't own a rental property, and as sure as hell had no property management experience. None of that. Guess what he had? Leadership, right? He was a great leader. He's led big teams. He understood culture. He understood systems. I knew my property management company would be four people when we started. It's going to be 5,000 people. So why would I hire somebody for four? I should be thinking in, a, in advance, right? I need somebody to be able to run my company for 5,000 people. And obviously, as we continue to grow, that has proved to be an amazing decision. And it helped me from day one be able to work on my business and not in because I always have had somebody running my company. He's done an incredible job. Number two, no shared accountability. 
I see this so much in real estate, guys, and so much in business. There is responsibilities that multiple people share, and it makes it very hard to transparently pinpoint who's doing a good job and who's not. A lot of people have property managers that wear 27 different hats, right? That's really, really tough when another person wears the same hats and you can't hold people accountable. So for us and our leaders in my company, no two people own the same thing, right? There's ways to do that if you really slow down and think about it, right? Who owns vacancy? Like who actually owns it? Who's accountable for it? Like who owns delinquency? And then over here, no single person can own more than three things. So if you walked into my office or talked to any of my employees, they could tell you the one, two, or three things that they are directly accountable for, that there's no shared accountability for, okay? Because I believe to do something excellent, you have to bring intensity. And you cannot bring intensity on more than three things. Nobody can do it. That's why we don't have property managers at my company, right? Because Property managers on site do 27 different things. I have, a, I have a property that's over 500 units. There's no property manager. Just a different way of doing it, right? Different way of doing it. No single person my whole company owns more than three things. All right, second biggest thing that helped me scale, systems, guys. Systems, systems, systems. <clears throat> so how do you put a system in place? I was actually, this is funny, on the way down here, my president and I were talking about a situation that occurred that we didn't have a system for. It starts with knowing that everything is a process. You know, I talk to a lot of real estate investors and some of my employees are getting into real estate now. It's just so funny, right? Like you see them say, oh, I just closed on the deal. I forgot to transfer the utilities. Or I forgot to do this. Oh yeah, I got to do this. It's because it's not part of a system. It's not part of a checklist. Everything you do in real estate has to be a system. How could I go from in 2019, four employees to over 100? to 2019 to 252 units to almost 4,000. Systems. You build systems in place that are repeatable. So the way to do that though, is you have to remember why did I do this today? And if I did that thing, how do I think through what system it should be a part of? What step-by-step -step system should I be a part of? To this day, if I find something that I have to do in my company, like meaning if I didn't do it, we would not get a result. I take myself out, I put it into a system, so then I can continue to work on the business and not in it. If the business re replies on me as the owner, there is something wrong. Then I, then I think about all the step-by-step, step-by-step uh, uh, step things that I need to do to get the desired result. For example, I will share real systems that we have in our management company, but if you just slow down for a second and think about, okay, I want to achieve a 1% delinquency. All right, well then, where does that start? Well, it obviously starts when a tenant doesn't pay after the first five days of the month, if that's what you have in your lease. Now just slow down and think through all the steps of what you need to do. Think about how much time each step takes and very important, who should do it? We forget about that one sometimes, right? Who's doing the steps? How much time should it take? Don't stop there. If the step is not initiated or done adequately, what is the roadblock? What is the contingency plan within that step? Then you move on to the result. And I end all of our processes at our company with a scoreboard. A lot of people don't do this. If you want the desired result, you have to have a scoreboard to be able to show everybody in the company who's doing well and who's not doing well. And originally when we introduced this at the company, our HR was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa, you know, like Betty, like who sucks? She's gonna get super offended and she's probably gonna leave. Guess what I said? Perfect. Because I want a Betty that sees she's last and she calls the person in the front, who's Tony, calls Tony and says, hey man, what are you doing? I don't wanna be last again. I don't wanna be last again. What are you doing to get the result that you are? That, I'm okay if Betty sucks right now, but, I want her to know it, right? Because the faster you can identify when you're not performing at the desired result within the system, the faster that you can get better if the person on your team is the person that you actually want. All right, so here is our most basic scoreboard, okay? The most basic one we have in our company. So I wanted to show you, like, if you have a couple units, like, you don't need anything fancy. 
So right here, this is how we hold our service techs accountable. Uh, they get points for communication. At our company, you have to communicate when a service request comes in, right? Something that needs to be fixed in 24 hours. If you don't do it, that's 33% of your bonus that you're not going to get. I'll talk about that later. Five stars. At App, we use Appfolio. Appfolio sends them a review every single time they'd be able to do it. Or better yet, they could get a Google review. Anything less than five stars means they didn't do the job. They didn't provide a great experience. Experience matters. 48 hours at our company, we have to execute every service request within 40 hours. If you didn't do that, you didn't do your job. It's super clear, very clear. And guess what? It's sent out to all of our service techs and the service techs leader. It goes all the way up to the president. I love that our service techs know that the president is get the same communication, right? Here's another system that we have. This is called Rocks at our company. It's one of the most important systems that we have. So I wanted to share that with you guys today. Basically what Rocks is, it takes a division of the company and it boils it down to the three most important priorities. Did you know there was a survey done? The top 50 CEOs of the Fortune 50 companies, they surveyed them and they asked, how much time do you spend on the three most important things? How much time a day do you spend on your three most important things for your company? This is the top 50 CEOs, like in the Fortune, Fortune 50. 28 minutes. 28 minutes. So at our company, we want to spend as many minutes as possible on the most important things. And as you are scaling, you want your team to reorganize themselves because there's always be too much work to get done in a day. But did you make the right decisions? So for us, this is, for example, our service tech rocks. You can see that our rock number one is to have the friendliest text in the world by achieving 70 Google reviews in Q3 and achieve a 4.5 overall at Folio score. Our second rock is speed is life. 97% of work orders are done within 48 hours. 85% are done within 24. And rock number three is beat the budget by 33K in Q3, right? First line up here, right underneath our commitments. And this is for our director. Underneath here, same rocks, right? For the leaders have different commitments. As you grow as a company, different levels within your organization should be doing different things, right? My director should not be literally executing service requests. Common sense. So what is he doing to be able to drive these things? Should be probably a lot more related to strategy and development. What are your leaders doing within your business or organization? So this really helps ground what your organization should be doing in every area of your company. So if they're confused, like, and talking about this fourth thing over here, like this every week they meet and they talk about these, it, it brings them right back. So we actually do that on a weekly basis, guys. Same day, same time, cannot be missed. All right, so I'm gonna actually share some systems and some leadership things we have, but I'm gonna incorporate those into what I believe has been really, really important to any business, um, not just a real estate business. And those are core values. It's the culture within your company. You know, a lot of companies, statistically speaking, 74% of employees are not engaged. They don't embody the company's core values and what you actually want. So from day one, I really wanted to think about like, what, what are my core, what are the things I truly believe in? And as we scale, it was very important for myself and my president and everybody else to make sure that we embodied those. I don't have enough time today to go through all of them, but I'm going to go through the top three. So the first one that we start with that's super important is speed is life. Everything in our company is speed. Speed kills guys. That's why Amazon has come on so fast, right? Like people pay for speed. If you can get something for free, you would pay if it comes there faster. Like speed is so important in our company. We do it in every single area. Even an interview, interview comes in through the door, we greet them, and if they can't keep up with us to the interview room, they're probably not gonna pass the interview. I, I'm not kidding, I don't have time to share all my speed examples, but let me share a couple with you guys. So this is an email when, I was, uh, when my team was making this presentation, I just sent them this email as a basic example. I thought it'd be raw, real. I got nothing here that, nothing to share with you guys here that we're not actually doing. So this last week, our service team, 98% of requests were done in 48 hours. Do you know in Wisconsin, the average time is three and a half weeks, right? This is everything. This is uh, appliance goes out. This is everything. All service requests, it's three and a half weeks. 84% of our service requests were 24 hours. 
Oh, Logan, you must just have a couple. I think I heard you remodel units. We had 153 just this week. And we did 90, 98% of them in 48 hours, 24 in speed. You don't think systems matter, right? We had one guy knock out 47 work orders in his territory, all within 24 hours. Crazy, right? How? Well, let me tell you about our system. So for us and our service techs, great systems, make sure they tie everything into where everybody wins, right? That's leadership in that system. So for us, our service tech, they get bonuses. They get $1 per unit. Oh, by the way, three and a half weeks in Wisconsin. Anyone want to guess the average amount of units that a service tech does in Wisconsin? Somewhere between 80 to 150 units. That's how much they can oversee to get it done in three and a half weeks. Our average service tech, 500 units is what they oversee. Our top service tech does 1,100. One guy. How? So obviously, we have a step-by-step -step process that is very, very strong. And we also have ridiculous incentives. So, for example, we have three ways we bonus our service tax. They get $1 per unit, 33 cents if they get them all done within 48 hours. If you don't get them done within 40 hours, you don't get the 33 cents. Number two, you have to have all five star reviews, experience, right? So, we don't want anything less than four stars. I'll talk about that a little bit later, how we get a service tax to perform it that way. No review is fine, but you can't have anything. You can't have a three. You can't do an okay job. Experience matters. And then lastly, budget. Well, how are you holding the service tax a budget? That doesn't make any sense. Well, if you just focus on speed and you don't fix it the first time, you're going to have to go back three more times. You're going to blow the budget. If you don't train yourself well and you have to hire, hire somebody to come and do it for you, it's going to cost probably three times as much. So it helps incentivize our service tax to take our free trainings and, cer and certifications, right? And follow our systems. And here's the best part. If you do all three, you get a dollar, right? Our average service tech's making a $500 bonus every single month. And then we're also, would it be nice if our service tech actually wanted to work harder and take on more units? Well, that's why our bonus lines up to unit count. Because our guy, Tony, who's doing 1,100 units, didn't start at 1,100 units, he was at five. And if there's no way to scale the system along with him, he would never have asked for the next 100 unit apartment that we bought or the next two, right? He wants actually more units because obviously see he can make more money. And the last thing we do, we also give different levels to our service tax, right? They start as a service tech one and we train them to, I mean, guys, fixing things in, in real estate, they're all boxes. Like I think sometimes we think it's really complex, but they're just like this 99% of what happens in an apartment unit happens in all apartment units, right? Just figure out where the utilities are and like any, and, and then you train them and you train them on those things, right? But we would expect a new service tech to be able to fix a garbage disposal, a leaky toilet. Sure. That's a service tech one. But would we expect them to put in a water heater or fix a furnace? No. AC? Yes. Furnace? No. Which is why if they are constantly bonusing and getting more units, we will actually make them eligible to become a service tech too. And now we'll train them how to do a furnace. And now we'll train them how to do a um, uh, water heater. We know, and then they'll make more money. And then we'll be able to lower budgets because we'll be able to outsource less stuff, right? This is just a really good example of all the things that you need to think about within a system to properly incentivize them. Calls. So my president and I called the top 10 biggest property management companies in the state of Wisconsin and then in the Midwest right? How many of the 10 do you think actually pick up the phone? Three. Three. How many of the seven we left voicemails call us back? Two. Two. That's 12 months worth of calls, four different times calling all of them, okay? So I said something. You know, this is, when we put the PowerPoint, this is literally the day before. I didn't like fake this for you guys. We take about 200 calls a day to about 1,400 calls a week. We also take 10,000 texts. I mean, it's 2023. It's kind of weird that we still take 200 calls, but we do. And I think if someone's going to take the time to call us, we should answer the phone. So we actually don't measure answering the phone. That's not three misses answering the phone. We measure picking up the phone on the second ring. We miss three times picking up the phone on the second ring. We score all the divisions and we send it out to the entire company. So obviously HR didn't want to hire this day because they're the ones who missed all three on the second ring. But it's visibility, right? I said that from day, we got, you gotta create a scoreboard that's visible. That's how we are consistently so good 
And that's how we can answer the phone in the second ring. Last thing, and I talked a lot about property management, but we are equally as good, some people would say better at construction. So we do about 100 to 150 rehabs, full rehabs per month. And we've done that for over two years running now. We complete each rehab in 72 hours, guys. Full rehabs can be all the way down to the studs. I'm talking LVP, trim, new cabinets, new tub, new countertops, gold standard. We have a really strong process to be able to put that in place. Like our guys are literally sitting with the materials as the resident's walking out. It's an 18 step process from move in to move out. And then a three day, 72 hours, knocking out the unit. We'll talk about that a little bit later too. We're spending somewhere between a million to $2 million just on rehabs. So that's our whole business is value add properties. We're going to rehab them. We're going to put money into it. And we're going to make sure that these 1970 to 2000 year properties are, don't look like the shade carpet, lime green walls that they used to. Second biggest core value is world-class standards. Reputation matters guys. And you want to make sure that you're putting out quality product. I think it protects yourself against a lot of liability, right? But also your reputation helps you be able to raise rent. People pay for quality, right? People, people will pay for quality if you do a great job. So at our apartments, one of the first things that we do is we make sure that the curb appeal is very strong. I have a lot of people that laugh at me for this, but we don't just cut the grass like most people. We edge the grass. We fertilize the grass. We landscape the grass, right? We want to make sure that our apartments actually look better than the single family house across the road. We have a policy on trash, number two, that all residents should be able to walk barefoot to the dumpsters, barefoot at any time. I mean, you might not want to right now, maybe in the middle of summer, but that's just our policy, guys, because trash is one of the biggest turnoffs. So we don't want trash on our properties, and we take it to the extent that you literally have to walk barefoot to the dumpsters, okay? Common areas, not only should they look good, obviously, but our community division is in charge of the smell, too. When I rented, my hallway smelled like curry. If it didn't smell like curry, probably marijuana, maybe smoke, right? So we work really, really hard that when you walk in our common areas, that it smells like fresh linen. That's our, that's our scent. That's our management company scent. How do we do it? Obviously, some we use plugins, right? Some really bad ones we have to put through the vents smell. We even have paint additives from Sherman Williams that change the smell of the paint within our common areas. When you walk in our common areas, it is noticeably different. Residents comment on it, they notice. We want people to have a different type of experience on how, not just how it looks, but how it feels and even how it smells. Um, one go back, talk about systems, talk about shared accountability, we talked about that. I got this question from a banker the other day. Yeah, that sounds good, Logan. I drove past your property, it looked like that. I just don't know how you could be sure that all of your properties look like the one I drove past. I'm gonna tell you how, no shared accountability. We have CTAs, they're called Community Territory Ambassadors, okay? What their job is, is to have a collection of properties up to 500 units similar to a service tech. And their job is to do the things I just shared with you. Their job is to make sure that the communities look good, feel good, et cetera. When we have somebody move in, within 72 hours, they have to knock on the door, introduce themselves, and give them a focus branded card. On that card, it says trash. You should be able to walk barefoot to the dumpsters. There's never trash in our communities. Grass, blah, blah, blah. Hallways, et cetera, et cetera. No pet shit in the grass. <laughs> you know, it has all these things that they're responsible for. And on the bottom of the card, it has their name. One of our best CTAs, name is Miguel. So it has Miguel's name, it has his phone number, and it has his email. And then it has his boss's name, boss's phone number, boss's email. So when he goes, hey, Bob, I'm glad you moved into the River Ridge apartment community. My name is Miguel. I want to walk you through what this apartment should look like. It's important to me that you know that we have world-class standards here, and it is my job. It's also important that you know that if you look on the bottom of this card, if I'm ever not doing my job, that I would really appreciate if you text, email, call me. If you don't feel comfortable doing that to me or flagging me down when I'm around, I got my boss's information. Please let him know because I get paid more money when I perform world-class. And obviously, if you see something that's not world-class, I want you to let me know right away. Seven days later, service tech Tony calls him. Say, hey, I heard Bob, you just moved into the River Ridge apartment community. How are you doing? How's everything going? You like the new remodel? Yeah, yeah, I like the remodel. Great. Well, if it's done the right way, you shouldn't see me. But if something's, something's broke, 
My job is to come and fix it. Hey, by the way, did you meet Miguel? Oh yeah, I met Miguel. Yeah, Miguel talked to me, you know, a couple days ago. Or hey, I didn't meet Miguel. Why do you think Tony, the service tech, has one of his scripted questions, did you meet Miguel, the CTA? If he didn't, he's obligated to go share that with his boss. So he's checking to make sure that Miguel introduced himself and set clear expectations. Just like for Tony, the service tech, his boss is gonna now call that Bob within two weeks, right? Systems should have checks and balances to make sure that all the things are happening. If they're not, you gotta have ways to be able to catch them, right? So that's how we know, because on, literally within the first 72 hours, we have somebody from our team introducing themselves, and on the first day, they met our move-in specialist. Turn quality, like pretty impressive that we would do them in 72 hours, sure. So far this year, our highest streak for quality is 168 straight move-ins with no go-backs. So you might be thinking, yes, we have renovation techs. They don't fix things, they just renovate. They don't have time to fix things when they're turning units as fast as they are. But speed wouldn't ma matter if the quality wasn't there. So we measure them on speed, quality, and budget. And quality, if, if a tenant moves in, a lot of you guys, if you own apartment complexes, you know how hard this is, and says, looks over the apartment, right? They gotta get you back the sheet of any misses in their apartment. Oh, scratch on the trim, noted. If we go back one time, wipes out their bonus. Our bar for quality is ridiculous, right? We make sure we tie in quality and speed and budgets all in one so that they all work in harmony. That way we're not just pounding out these rehabs that look like shit. When you're spending fifteen to twenty thousand dollars on a rehab and a tenant walks in and is not wowed, stuck on the lock not working or a scratch in the trim, that's the opposite effect of what we want. That's how we can go 168 straight move-ins. Quality, very, very high bar. Last core value I want to share with you, and then I'm going to put this together in a, in a real world example. Um, experiences super important and I do think this is one of the core values that we live by that obviously a lot of property management company landlords and investors I see forget what they forget is the fact that Disney World has raised their prices faster than almost any other company over the last decade and not many people complain and it's always full people pay for experiences guys right and guess what baby boomers are not the number one generation renting for anymore it's Gen X it's Millennials it's Gen Z they care about amenities, they care about experience, they care about technology, and you should adapt. So at our company, we do the same thing. We adapt, and I, I could go through all these different examples with you on how, how we brought experience to life, but I thought I would share with you one of the ones that I think is the worst in most companies, um, actually two of the worst processes, and maybe that can help you guys out. First of all, that's the service tech that you all picture, right? When you picture a guy that knows how to fix everything, Sometimes we picture that person maybe a little grumpy, right? Maybe not the five-star experience that you're looking for at your company, but you're like, ah, he knows that he's so good. He knows how to fix anything. And all these young guys, they don't know how to fix anything. So what are we going to do? Young guys can give great experience, but they can't even fix the toilet. you got to make things simple. All our processes are super simple. What we do and why our service techs actually get the most five-star reviews in our company we worked with them. I said, hey, hey, Tony, I get it. I get it, man. But can you just do three things? You think you could, you could do three things for us if I make them super simple? And I promise you, if you do these, only these three things, you won't get anything less than a five-star review. Just three simple things. Pull up on your phone before you walk in because you have to anyway. And on your phone, you use that folio. It has the tenant's name that needed to fix the garbage disposal. Her name's Molly. So all I want you to do, number one, knock on the door. Introduce yourself and say Molly's name and ask her if she wants you to put on the booties or take off your shoes. Can you do that? Pretty simple, right? Call her by name, introduce yourself, booties, no booties, shoes, no shoes. That's it. Can you do that? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's not bad. Okay. Walk through the door and I just want you to give one compliment. This is how easy it is. Oh, that's a nice dog. What's your dog's name? Oh, cute kid. Cool picture frame. Nice hair. One, not two, just one. Literally walk in and make something up and say one compliment. They will be freaking shocked. Property management bar is down here, Tony. Okay? Down here. She's shocked that you already know her name. 
She's shocked that you took it off the shoes. Just say she has a nice haircut, even if she doesn't. You know what step three is, Tony? You're gonna love step three. Get the hell out of the way and go fix it by working neat and clean and then leave. That's all I want you to do. Fix the freaking garbage disposal by working neat and clean and then leave. If you do those three things, right? Before I shared those three things with you, you're like, no, no, my service tech, uh-uh. No, 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 I'm, I'm never gonna get Bob to, to get a five-star review. It's not, it, it's not that hard if you think through the system and you break it down for your team. Everything within our team, everything within our systems, we try to relate to something and make it super easy. I'm gonna give you another one. You guys seem to like the funny one. I think most move-ins, move-in processes are awful. People, I just shared with you, like we don't answer the phone, right? We don't really, we treat the tenant as a tenant and not as a relationship. I, I even hear a lot of investors get so excited. Ah, I got the lease. I got the lease, this is great. You don't make money on the lease. You make money on the renewal. You make money on the renewal. You do not make money on the lease. You make money on the renewal. How do you do that? Experience. So I'm gonna tell you how we do experience in our company. We actually have a really, really long process, but I'm gonna tell you how, what we compare it to and how we made the experience something where all of our team members can relate to, all right? It's dating. It's a marriage. So if you, in 2023, wanted to date somebody, I've been married over 10 years, so I haven't done this in a while, but I think you would just pull up your phone and you'd probably go to something like Tinder, right? And you'd be looking at pictures. Well, that's what a renter does, right? Oh, I need a place, so I'm gonna be looking at pictures. Now on Tinder, I would imagine that there would be people's best pictures. Like you would wanna put your best looking pictures so somebody sw swipes right to start that date. I can't believe, guys, the amount of property management companies and real estate investors that have horrible pictures of their units. You wanna get the most amount of rent. If you wanna get the date, you should have the best looking pictures. So for us, it always starts with the best looking pictures of our apartment units. And then our engagement specialists and our leasing agents, okay? We work so hard to have killer conversations, right? Because you're not gonna get the date if you don't have a good first initial conversation. And I, I think there's a lot of, we, did, fun fact, 99% of our move-ins have never seen the unit, right? Think That conversation has to be pretty good and same with those pictures. All right, so then you do a great job and then it's the move-in. That in the dating process is your first date. It's when you see your date. And if you pulled up to your date and you put a picture of a six pack and she sees that you have a belly, what is gonna happen? She is going to run. Her friend's going to call. The date is over. So I can't believe this. You can't fool the residents, guys. When they walk into the unit, they should be wowed. Whoa, this is even better than the picture. Like, they should be wowed. That's how we went 168 straight move-ins, guys. We want to show the best pictures, but we usually have a thing or two that we undersold within the unit that is going to make it pop, right? That's gonna make them call their mom after the date. I think he's a pretty good guy, right? And then if that first date goes well, you're in the honeymoon, right? You're in the honeymoon phase where you wanna to talk to each other all the time and you wanna, you know what I mean? You wanna fill each other out before marriage. Well, that's why our CTAs talk to him in 72 hours. That's why our service tech talks to him after seven days. That's why his boss talks to him in two weeks. That's why the director calls him within 30 days. If you kill him, with amazing experience within the first 90 days, you won't hear from them from day 91 till 12 months, guys. Most companies though, they just move them in, hope it goes okay. We crush our residents in the first 90 days. It's honeymoon phase. That's what I want you to teach your team to think about. Okay, day 91, you don't hear from them, kind of awesome, right? You don't have to spend as much money now. 12 months comes along, and there's two things that happen in 12 months, right guys? They're either gonna renew the marriage, because you're married now, or they're gonna ask for a divorce, one or the other. So obviously we always hope they renew the marriage, right? We have a little conversation, we have a pretty cool renewal sheet, we're gonna bump up rent a little bit, you know, cost of living has went up. Um, if they decide to divorce, a lot of companies, oh, 30 day divorce, uh, 30 day notice, 60 day notice, I'm gonna move out. They just file it, they get ready. No, that's not what you would do if you were married to somebody for 12 months and out of nowhere they ask for a divorce. Especially if you wanted to stay married to them. Obviously, there's some people that you're probably happy that they're divorcing you. No, you would what? You would see a counselor. 
right? You would go through some sort of mediation. So at our company, that's what our engagement specialists do, right? Hey, Bob, I noticed that you, uh, you're, looking for, you're looking to move out. And Bob goes, you come, oh, yeah, I'm moving from Milwaukee to Green Bay. Oh, did you know we, we have some apartments in Green Bay? We can try this long distance relationship. We can move to Green Bay, right? You would be surprised the percentage of people that we call and we have a conversation with and we're actually able to stay married to. So this is just another good example, guys. Systems and leaderships and making it relatable to your team. That's how I've been able to scale because everything's a system and it's very easy to operate. Can you imagine like as a team member when you said, I want you to have a good call with the resident every time they call. Just have a good, good. Or can you imagine if you have an engagement specialist that's 18 and you tell her about the whole Tinder story I just told you about, do you think she's gonna think differently when she's having that conversation with the resident? Yeah, of course she is, right? You wanna make it relatable, guys. All right, right on time. So applying leadership, system, and culture. Let's put this into an example. If you're like me, it's like, yeah, these are great, but like, show me how you've done that in an, in an example. So I pulled one of our re recent full cycle um, deals that we've done. So this is a real deal. Um, the name of the uh, apartment is The Forge on Webster. I bought this deal for 7.1 million. It's 114 units. Um, you're gonna see that it did 78,000 a month. NOI, 38,000. And I'm gonna show you how in 13 months, because I do everything fast, everything with speed. I'm just showing you a couple examples on my slide. In th thir 13 months, we went from 38,000 in NOI to 68. All right, what, real, here's the actual appraisal. Actual date, February 1st of 2022, all right? All right, every time I do uh, appraisal, guys, and I'm buying a property, I do an as, is appraisal and an as complete or a subject to. If you're not sure what that is, it's basically like, what's the property worth as it currently stands, but what will it be worth after you renovate it, right? So this was a page from my appraisal. Um, you're gonna see that they're projecting 98,000 a month or 1.185 when I'm done with it. And they're projecting an NOI of 57.5, remember from 38. And they're thinking I'm gonna do this in uh, have it done in March 1st of 2024. So about two years and one month is what they're looking at. Six and a quarter cap rate, you know, at that time. And then I'm planning on putting in 3.5 million of renovations. I am starting and I have the deal and I'm working through the contingencies. I come up with my branding strategy along with my business strategy. I'm very good at systems and there's a lot of people very good at execution. Most of you guys, especially if you're men, aren't really good at picking out the right brand. And you think you are, but like why? It's the same amount of money if you just ask for advice from somebody that's going to actually pick something that's still going to be in style 10 to 20 years from now. So companies do this. Before I had an actual brand manager on site, I would always have a company be able to do this. And they would put together a brand strategy uh, for us on the apartment, right? There's two reasons you do it. One is obviously if you're gonna spend this much money, you wanna get it right. So this is what the apartment looked like before. This is what they're recommending me to do, right? Some inspiration of where they got it from. They'll do the sign and the decals and everything else of where it should go. They'll even pick out the colors and then this is what it's gonna look like. I said two reasons though, second reason. When you're repositioning on a property, you want to do this as fast as possible. Time is risk. So obviously, what do you need to show that you can't do this on day one? It might take 30 days to be able to do this, but you could show them if you paid for a design. I mean, all this does not cost very much money. It's actually very relatively inexpensive. But the picture itself helps our ability to be able to sell to the resident what the apartment is going to look like which is key guys, because they're like, oh wow. Another helpful thing. What do you think the, if you have this rendering before close and in your welcome letter, when you go over the change in property management and all these other things, but you also say, hey, I'm gonna spend $3 million on your apartment. Like here's a picture of what it's gonna look like besides that you know, sad, white, rusted exterior picture. I mean, they already know you bought it and you're gonna raise some of the rent, okay? But if you, you aren't gonna get as many people move out. You might even be able to push harder if not only you can tell them how much you're gonna spend, but you can actually show them what it's gonna look like. Here's a big tip. 
that I see in scaling and why we're able to reposition as people, our, our properties a lot faster than others is when all the contingencies are waived. Most real estate investors are like, bank said, yes, we're good. Now they just wait a month until it actually closes and then they close it and then they open up their champagne and they're all excited. No. When we're, as we're moving through the contingencies, what we like to do is we like to get into the property. Like, my entire business strategy is already locked in and ready to go. And now we're calling all of our, we're making sure our employees are ready to go. Any exterior contractors are ready to go for day one. I closed on 128 units uh, here in Milwaukee a couple of weeks ago. We had 30 employees there. We have Rolls trucks there. We changed over all the electrical. Like we, we move really, really quickly before it even closes to have everything lined up for day one. And on this property, I called the seller. I said, hey, in the contract, it said you couldn't lease units anymore. I noticed you have 40 vacancies with this 114 units. People are just leaving. Can I rehab some units? I'll give you an insurance waiver. A lot of my properties, guys, I get permission from the sellers and I actually start rehabbing units before it close. If you're a beginning investor, probably don't do this. If you feel confident enough it's gonna close, Go start rehabbing some of those units. On this deal, I rehabbed 37 units and spent $500,000 before close. A little bit of a risk, but I knew it was going to close. And if you can at least rehab one or two units, guess what you can do on day one? You can market it and you can check your business plan where your market comes right on day one. Not day 30, on day one. What an advantage that can be. Also on day one, oh yeah, here's what they look like. Also on day one, they had underground parking, which was full of broken ski and broken lights and I'm sure drug deals and everything else down here where you could be renting out um, the space wasn't being rented out. Cleaned it all up, power washed the whole thing, lit it all up, painted it all, all on day one. We also put in all brand new lighting on the outside. We landscaped everything, pulled out all the new stuff, put on new paint, signing, and the owner left us with 97 service requests. Yes. We knocked all those out as well, too. Building goodwill on day one, right? A lot of people are having champagne. This is what I was doing. They usually put me on power washing. All right, this is what it looks like now. Exterior so it was, it was all wrapped up, right? Cool, you see the rendering. This is not a rendering picture. This is what it actually looks like. I think the team did a better job than the rendering, actually. Why do you think I focused on the exterior and then the unit rehabs, but not the common areas? Well, if you're like me and you're buying a lot of value add properties, Usually there's a few drug dealers. Usually there's a few people that, you know, have been arrested a few times that aren't great people that are going to be violating policies. You're going to have people moving out is all I'm saying. When people move out that aren't very happy with you, what happens to the flooring in the common areas and the walls as they're pulling their couches out? Keep the common areas the way it is, okay? Maybe show the residents what the common area is going to look like, but usually we do common areas last and we do it about 12, the second winter is when we'll hit the common areas. How many years look like on top? Bottom. Look, don't forget about the laundry rooms. This one had elevators. Elevators kind of suck. Here's what it looks like, the Forza Webster. This is a one bedroom unit. Right before it was $600. It now rents up for $899. We are full. Um, utilities are rubbed back now. So $35 for water, $25 for heat. Um, there's a monthly service fee to take care of landscaping, common areas, etc. Uh, we and our, and this is in Green Bay, um, high speed fiber internet, no throttle runs about 80 bucks. We're able to get it for 50 for the residents and it actually costs 15. So we're making $35 for saving the resident about $30 win win. Um, parking, underground parking was charging nothing, $79. By the way, all this is disclosed on the website, right, Josh? If you heard the last guy, <laughs> um, so total is $600, um, $1,174 is the new rent. Obviously, you can see the difference on the bottom. If you remember, this was cap rate of six and a quarter. So that $15,000 investment equated to $110,000 worth of value. As landlords, as real estate investors, as property management companies, you can make a lot of money by actually investing in your property and giving the residents what they want. And that's exactly what we did here. All right, remember, this was the uh, subject to appraisal. So this was before that I closed on the property. They said that I would hit uh, 690,000 in NOI and I would do it on March 1st of 2024. 
I had him come back out on February 17th of this year, 2023, if you see in the highlights, 13 months later, and I finished it. All right? So, as is NOI, 820000 Not six ninety, right? Not 38000 a month. 68000 a month, right? Not 78000 in total income. 111000 in total income. You notice they did increase my cap rate from six and a quarter to six and a half, but I guess that makes sense with the rising interest rates and things going on. But you can also see my value went up to about 12 and a half million. So I want to pause here for a second for all those that don't think speed matters. Appraisal company said there's no way you're not going to get this done in two years. I did. Actually in one year and nine days. What do you think happens if I went slower? I popped that champagne. I didn't get after my unit turns. I didn't reposition this. And I actually waited until March of 2024, right? This coming spring to finish the renovations. What do you think what my interest rate would be as opposed to doing this in February of this year? You don't think speed matters? 7.1 to 12.6 valuation. I think it's worth 14 right now. That was back in March. So we continue to reposition. Total amount made was 951,000. How did I get that number? That was the amount of money that I had after I paid myself back what I put into the property and my down payment from the refi. So subtract CapEx, down payment, and what I put in, almost a million dollars in a year and nine days. So speed kills, because now I have that money back. If I don't have that back, I have my down payment plus the two to three million dollars of the CapEx stuck. So forget interest rates for a second, right? And usually a lot of people are like, whoa, I bet you can't do that now. Yeah, I did today. I just did a refi, just showed Aaron over here, just did a $2.5 million refi on the way down here, just finished it. You can do second mortgages. The blending rate's not that bad. If your first mortgage is a five year, right? And you're locked into a three or 4%, then who cares that you have a seven and a half on the refi? The blended rate's not bad. Put a second mortgage on it. Um, especially if you want velocity of money. And that's what speed does, guys. Like, that's how I was able to scale. That's how I'm continuing to be able to get scale because my velocity is coming from two, two big areas. Number one, obviously, I started small. It took me three years to buy seven units. But if you own all the equity, the cash flow is ridiculous, right? <laughs> when I was at 17 units and I owned 100%, it's like a syndicator that owns 100 units that owns five, right? Great that you own 100 units. My cash flow matters and it helps you be able to velocitize. Okay. Obviously in refi, it helps you be able to velocitize. I'd have to split this with all my partners. So I took all the risk, but you also get all the reward. So that's number one. Number two, obviously the systems and my property management slash construction company helped me do this because if my company does not rely on me, I can focus my time on new acquisitions. I can focus my time on business strategy. I can focus my time on developing my president. And all I have to do is buy the next property and then plug it in. It's harder to do when you start, but if you create the systems then you sh and the systems are working, you don't have to do that thing again. I was one of the four employees at 252 units. I did, I have done everything. I've showed units, I've cleaned units. I've done everything in my company, but I just worked really, really hard to create a system and put a person into that system so that I wouldn't have to continue to do it. And that's the difference between scaling and not scaling.